Okay, welcome to Access Europe for October. Thank you to the amazingly 50 people that are now present at this meeting. That is extremely encouraging. And I think it says a lot about the future of Access that we have so many people here. Today we are blessed to have Juan Soto, who is a long-standing Access MVP. He's also the founder of the accessusergroups.org, set up this about seven or eight years ago now, and I think 2014, nine years ago now, to develop a series of online meetings. Juan is also the owner of IT Impact, and you can see the web address there, which is a very successful business specializing in Access and SQL Server. There will be a PowerPoint available after this meeting, which you will be able to download from either of the two addresses at the bottom there. But at this point, enough from me. Juan, are you ready to take over? And you can tell us more about yourself when you do, if you wish. Yes, I am. Welcome, everybody. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. All right. Yes. So, yes. Um, hi, Juan. Hi, hi. I hope everyone, now we have 52 participants, probably one of the biggest gatherings. No, it is the biggest gathering, so we broke a record today. When I started this organization many years ago, I did it because back then I was traveling between cities, participating in different user groups, and um, it really, uh, I was seeing the trend, right, where download trend of people, less and less people coming to these meetings. I said, you know what, um, the SQL Server guys had a great online model with virtual chapters, and that's why I decided to start accessusergroups.org. I um, wanted to be let you know, first off, that whatever opinions and statements I'm making here today are purely mine and not from Microsoft. Uh, you, as we probably guessed, as an Access MVP, I have a privy to some things that I will not be mentioning here. But suffice to say that, uh, in general, I do believe Access has a great future for from us, but I will be making my case on that later on in the presentation. Uh, and um, please feel free to chat and, and ask questions in the chat as we go along. And I'm going to make sure that I can see the chat here. If I can, I have multiple monitors here. Let me see. Oh, it looks like I won't be able to do that. But, uh, but, uh, Colin, you'll let me know if there's any questions I need to address in between slides. You know, one of the things that you may not be aware of is Access is the most popular database in the world uh, by far, right? And so there's a few reasons for that. Number one is that it comes with Office. And so every time you install Office, 99.99% .99 of the time, you'll get Access, right? And... Whether you use it or don't use it, that's something else, right? But it is installed on the most des more desktops than any other database technology in the world. And uh, it's a mature product. It's been around since before the internet. Uh, and because it was around since before the internet, it, it, uh, it does require hand-holding and special techniques to make it work with the internet. So if you have the SQL Azure service, I have a series of videos on the uh, official Access User Group channel called SQL Server Academy, where you will learn how to, in a series of videos, optimize access to work with the Azure SQL Service or Remote Desktop Server, uh, SQL Server, Remote SQL Server, or in a WAN, where you have a company that has multiple um, buildings in different parts of the world, and there is a SQL Server in a building somewhere else, and you need to connect to it. So please take a look at those videos. So I get this a lot. That's an Access MVP. And I get this even from customers who call me up, and a new customer says, hey, I heard Access is going away, and I've, I'm using Access, and um, I'm calling you to see what we can do, right, about my Access. And so one of the things that I do as an MVP, as an ambassador, because we are all ambassadors, Colin, Crystal, I believe. Is there anybody else? Also, any of the other MVP? Uh, let me know. But um, at least Colin, Crystal, and myself, we consider ourselves ambassadors of the product. We love this product. We can make it sing and dance. And we hear this quite often. I hear it quite often, at least once every few months. And, you know, this is the rumor mill of the internet, right? People hear stuff uh, and they, they, they imagine this fact when it's not. And so we're going to be talking later on in the presentation about how to counter these, these things. But uh, 
Suffice to say, access is not going away, and I'll be proving my case on that here shortly. Now, one of the issues that you're going to find is that uh, <laughs> some IT departments do not like access. They just don't, right? That's just a fact. They always don't access. And I see this uh, across many IT departments. And so um, I'm going to explain why IT departments don't like access, and it's because it's their fault because they install access on every desktop, right? And so when you give a modern technology worker a suite of products such as Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, and so forth, they're going to use them because now it's out of your purview, IT, right? It's on my desktop. You install it for me. There's an implicit authorization from the IT department that it's okay to use this product, this access database, to solve my mission critical needs. And so when they when when that happens, it's great because the users can can use the product. But usually what happens is you've got a department manager who has a critical need, right? I've I've seen many cases, but let's assume somebody needs a label printed and slapped on a skid at the end of the production line. Right? So they have pretty produced widgets, they create the skid, the product, money multiple boxes, they shrink wrap it or not shrink wrap it, and then they need to put a, a, a label on it. Well, their ERP system doesn't do that. Or if they did, if it does, it's very hard to get the vendor to add a barcode or add a Julian date or whatever requirement that's needed. And so what people end up doing is they're they're doing this by hand, right? And then uh, the product manager says, well, you know, the problem with by hand is that you might make mistakes when you create, create the label. So let's go ahead and let's approach IT with a request to see if they can create these labels for us, All right? So they go to the PMO office. The PMO office says, yeah, great. Yeah, no problem. We'll do that for you. We'll slot you in. In 12 months, we'll get started. In 16 months, you should have the web app ready to do the uh, labels. I'm like, uh, this is critical. But the problem you have is the PMO office is over budget and over underwhelmed, overwhelmed with an ERP upgrade. Huge SAP upgrade, right? Or they just they just don't see this as a mission critical capability that they need to do within their purview. All the other mission critical things they know. So what that happens is the manager then finds out that Joey in the warehouse, a whiz kid with uh, computers, steps up and says, "Well, I can do that in Access. Not a problem. We can do it." So he goes. Joey sits down at the computer, and within a day has a database with a simple form. You enter the lot number, you enter the uh, the product name, you enter the number of cases, right? And then he downloaded a font, barcode font that he can use to uh, print the label. And then you hit the print button and it prints the label at the end of the production line, which is magical. People are just amazed with Joey. This kid within a few days was able to come up with a solution to save our, our high because you know, it just records great. So everybody forgets about it. PMO forgets about it. Production managers forgets about it. Everybody's happy. It's going great. Until Joey leaves. And now the database is no longer working. For some reason, there's some issue, right? Maybe there was a major upgrade of office. The barcode thing is not, it needs to be upgraded. And now it's instead of code three of nine, it needs to be 128. Whatever the reason is, Joey's gone. And now the production manager turns to IT and says, hey, uh, remember that request I had with you guys in the PMO office uh, nine months ago? Well, we ended up using Access, and now we need your help. PMO office says, we don't, we don't know Access. We don't, we're not Access experts. It's not within our technology stack. If we were Java, .NET, C Sharp, yeah, we can definitely help you out. We don't know Access. And so now you have a mission-critical application that is not being championed by anybody who understands access well or VBA well, and is producing all kinds of stress to the IT department. And I've seen this happen where the operations vice president and the CIO get into charting matches uh, because the assumption here is what? You're an IT, you should be an access expert. In fact, you install access on all these desktops, right? You got SQL Server DBAs, you got business analysts, you got web developers. What do I mean? What do you mean you don't have you don't know access? I got this thing that's helping me 
the ship widgets out the door. So figure it out, right? And so the CIO turns to his DBA and he gets saddled with, with uh, doing this. Now, DBAs are used to what? They're used to a uh, relational diagram. They're used to tables having primary keys. They used to have tables, every table having secondary keys, right? They're used to a structured design. Many times, however, the solutions that are developed by users are not, these users are not professional database developers. They don't have any relational database knowledge. They don't understand relational diagrams. They understand the, they don't understand the comments of primary keys. But they don't need to because access is very forgiving. You can create a table and access with no primary key, not a problem. You can create uh, you can create a, a complete solution without any relational diagram, without any foreign keys. It just works. And that's the beauty of access. You have a person who has no experience with database technologies or experience with coding able to develop mission critical applications for the enterprise when the dba developer in the, the case i was at i mentioned the label that's um probably easy easy one but what if the it's a whole erp database that was created to manage the, the enterprise which i come come across constantly because i'm a manufacturing engineer i'm a mechanical engineer i have uh, 20 plus years in operations manufacturing and so we get a lot of that work with factories call us. You'd be surprised how many factories in the U.S. use access as their ERP system, especially factories with $500 million or less, right? They just don't have the time resources to buy an SAP for three or four million. They turn to access. But you'd be surprised how this line of work, we see databases that don't follow relational database guidelines, right? They're not normalized fields with spaces in them, right? Uh, tables with no primary keys. And they're so happy with the database. They're like, oh, we got this wonderful database, but it's slow. Uh, it's been crashing lately. Well, it's been slow and been crashing because they've been adding more users and more data and they're approaching that two gigabyte limit, right? And they don't know that. When I we look at their, their system to analyze what issues they're having, that was one of the first things that we look at. The size of the file, the database, how well designed is it? Is it using a lot of macros or a lot of code? And so a lot of times you have these professionals in IT who get saddled with a system that has become mission critical, not well, well designed in terms of database, uh, term, uh, database relational theory, and it's a mess. Right? And so they have to step in or find somebody like myself to come in and uh, look at the issue. Last week, two weeks ago, I was an ice cream manufacturing company in Michigan. They use access to run the whole plant, order, entry, procurement of the materials, right? The, the milk, the butter, the ingredients, uh, the packaging. It's all handled by access. Um, the, uh, the production schedule, quality control, warehousing, shipping, every facet of that operation is handled by an access database with a SQL Server backend. But they call me up because uh, their access developer is retiring. And so um, I was able to come in and for three days, ate as much ice cream as I could. <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised how well ice cream tastes off the production line. It's just not the same when you get it off the store. And, um, and you know, I said, look, uh, at the end of the three days, this is something I usually do. I, I, when a manufacturing company calls me up, I offer this three-day package. And the last day, I meet with the management team. And I, find, I give them my findings. Well, I always start with the good stuff, right? I say, look, this, this is what's great about your system. Completely customized to your need, right? Access can fit your organization like a glove. And you can't say that with every ERP system, with the SAP Microsoft Dynamics, Oracle Systems. You can't say that they fit the enterprise like a glove. It could fit the enterprise like a glove, but then you have to maybe spend many millions of dollars and that causes its own issues, right? As opposed to creating a solution access. I said, well, look, it fits you like a glove. The uh, system is highly customized to your, to your operation. 
it's become mission critical, right? You can't, can you ship? You could, but it's going to be very difficult, right? Uh, they have 24 hour operation. So they, have, they run three shifts continuously for se seven days. The whole thing is runs off access with SQL Server. I, I gave him my findings. I have a question. Somebody raised their hand, David Miles, Colin. Yep, I was just going to, while David gets a chance to turn on his microphone, if he wants to ask a question, there was one very early question. People weren't sure what the PMO acronym stood for. Project Management Office. Right, one of you got it right. I think that was George. So what is the future? Right. What is it that we can expect with this product that we all love and adore? And to a certain extent, what is the future of VBA? Uh, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. And that's what you see when you press uh, Alt F11 or Control G. You see the code window. That's called the IDE. And more importantly, where is my co-pilot for access, right? <laughs> where is it? Because, you know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, they're, they're getting their co-pilot. And, you know, I would love to see a co-pilot for access, right? Create this table. Create this form based on this table. I need an order entry table. Can you go ahead and do that, right? There is a questions about uh, what is the future. And so when you get questions like that, here's how you want to respond. You know, first of all, you point them to the roadmap. There is a roadmap and Colin, maybe you can post it here, George. Uh, George, by the way, welcome. George is a former MVP, also the chapter president of Access Pacific user groups, uh, but if somebody can point the, put a roadmap copy. Now on the roadmap currently, you may see one or two things, right? It's not as busy as it is in Excel or Word, but there is at least a roadmap of what's coming along. And that's a positive thing because you would you can argue, oh, is Microsoft improving the product? Yes, it is. There's a series of things. Now, the other thing is point them also, I didn't mention this, but there is also an official access blog so somebody can put that in the comments there for the official access blog, where you see the announcements of the new features coming along. Recently, we had an improvement where we've increased the memory upgrade of the 32-bit version so it can access more memory. And that's gonna help tremendously for those people who have memory errors. I would argue your better bet is to move to access 64-bit, but there are some really good reasons why someone would not uh, upgrade to 64-bit. Access is a mature product. What does that mean? It's a, a very stable product, part of the Office ecosystem. It's not going anywhere, anywhere. But more importantly, let's do a thought exercise. What would happen if tomorrow the Access, uh, Microsoft uh, announces, you know, Access is end of life. It's gonna be in 2028. Let's assume we hear something like that, end of life, 2028. You're gonna hear <laughs> an uproar from a community that you've never heard before because it's the most popular database in the world. But in that sense, you'll hear an uproar that's incredible. Now on the prior slide, I mentioned about BBA, Visual Basic for Applications. BBA is going away. It's not going away. And I can even make the case, the reason it's not going away is because Excel uses the VBA extensively. So as there is, you know, Access is the most popular database in the world. But there is many more times spreadsheets than there are access databases in the world. And I don't know exactly how many times, three or four or five or 10 times more Excel spreadsheets. And a lot of those spreadsheets use VBA to accomplish wonderful things. And so when I hear that VBA is going away, I says, no, it's not going away because for the simple matter that the VBA in Office is a shared component. And so Word, Excel, Outlook, Access, all use the VBA IDE. And that's actually maintained by a separate group. So in other words, the Microsoft Access team is not responsible for the IDE. And I said there, there's a separate group at Microsoft, at least back then, back when I found out two years ago, that's, when, that's what the case is. And so when you hear things like, oh, VBA is going away, that's not the case because then the Excel guys would uh, green bloody murder, as uh, Brits like to say. We have a thriving MVP community. We have this organization, accessusergroups.org, right? We have a lot going for the product. Autoaccess.com, another great community that George helps manage on the call. He's an admin there. There is a case to be made that there is improvements being made to the product. 
based on the blog, official access blog, there is a roadmap points to new features. And if even if there was no more efforts to improve the system, it's going to stay here forever because of the fact that it shares components with other popular access applications. Now, think about access and how it would compare to other products out there. And I'm, I would make the case, uh, Google, what would happen if Google, because Google has spreadsheets, right? They have docs. Notice that there is no database. Has anybody noticed that? There is no database there for Google. You got the, the word equivalent, you got the spreadsheet equivalent. I'm not aware of any product from, from Google that does what Access does. And so you've got this wonderful technology where Microsoft is ahead of the pack. There are other, uh, back in the day, I used to be a Paradox developer and then, and then there was Delphi and those technologies still exist. Those desktop databases still exist. Um, but there are web equivalents, right? Um, databases and uh, Caspio comes to mind, right? So if Google were to enter this fray, they might go and say, let's just buy Caspio and do that. Now you've got power apps on the horizon. They're very similar to Axe. And in fact, a lot of my Axis developers are power app developers because of the fact that uh, we leverage these power apps in the enterprise for our clients. And so, but it doesn't have the power and flexibility of access. Can I design a power app application platform to handle a factory? No, I can't. Will it do it one day? It might. Right now, it doesn't. And I don't see it happening for any time soon. So when people say, you know, access is going away or VBA is going away, you have the market implication. You have this locked up market community in your hands, what Microsoft has. And they're not going to just let that go. They want to be able to make this, if anything, they want this community to make the transition to power up as much as possible. And eventually move, move all of us. Maybe eventually all of us will be power up developers. I don't know. We may or may not be. Because Power App has this disadvantage. Number one is it requires internet. I had this um, company call me up once. They paint cellphone towers, right? So they call me up and says, hey, Juan, um, we want you to create this database for us that uh, we can keep track. The crews can then keep track of their work. And when every time they, they work on a cell phone tower. Sometimes those guys, and it wasn't a cell phone tower. So I think it was electrical towers. So they take that electrical. Cell phone towers, you're going to have internet. But electrical towers may not, right? And so they said, well, you know, after I start talking to them, I, they, they told me they dropped these crews using helicopters because sometimes these towers are such a remote place. They drop a helicopter. So when I asked them, do they have it? And they says, no, nah, no, not all the time. And so you need a disconnected database to be able to uh, provide them with a database they can run on a local PC. And then uh, what we proposed to them is when they got back to the hotel, they can then plug in and then upload the data to the uh, master SQL server back at corporate. A few comments about com objects and yeah. ActiveX objects and so on. Tim, do you want to ask about your com question earlier on? Yeah, yeah thank you. You were talking about 64. We, we've avoided going to 64-bit because my understanding is, uh, I, I'm sorry, we use a use it as a laboratory in information management system, access front end, SQL server back end. And I use the uh, ActiveX objects and COM objects. It, well, it is used extensively in there. And I was told 64-bit did not support several of these COM objects or ActiveX. Is that not true? So you need to reach out to the vendors, right? If you, especially when you have these com objects that are specialized interface with the lab equipment, reach out to the vendor to see if they have an updated technology uh, that you can incorporate in the 64 bit. That would be Microsoft because I use their MS Com 32 ActiveX yeah. object for the commun serial it's RS232 communications, the balances. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so I've used that too. The uh, the Air Force uh, hired us to create a database to interface with some uh, systems they have. Uh, but yeah, um, I I am I see that some people here saying that God Com will never support sixty four bit and they won't uh, be able to do that. The other alternative would be to um, uh, approach the vendor the equipment if that vendor is still available 
and seeing what they recommend uh, with newer customers that are not using Access, but using, for example, .NET or C Sharp, and then create a DLL using .NET or C Sharp that will interface with your Access database. So that the component, the DLL component, is the one that's retrieving the database, database from that stream, the data from that stream, and then posting it back into your uh, directly into the SQL Server table, ideally, or through a LinkedIn uh, table and access. Okay, thank you. All right, so after you heard all of that, you're probably wondering, uh, is there a future for me in access? Right? If you're thinking, I mean, if you're if you're thinking about starting your own practice, or you're thinking about uh, becoming an access consultant, which I encourage you to do, uh, I I don't see this as um, I see this as a vast ocean and, and and I don't see other sharks in the waters. Many times when the clients approach me and call me up, hey, I have this project for you. I can't tell you how many times they tell me I couldn't find an access guy to help me, <laughs> right? They just, they just have a difficult time in finding these access people on the web for some reason. And so, uh, or in their local communities, right? So it's hard to say, you know, can I find somebody in Sandusky, Ohio to help me with database? And um I had a meeting with a factory um, last month where the CFO said, uh, we feel blessed that we found you because we were worried. We couldn't find anybody. And so we you know we service accounts throughout the U.S. and Canada. And uh, I hear that a lot. So if you're thinking about launching a career as an access consultant, there's plenty of work out there. But, you know, you have to relate to what's happening with the COBOL guys. That uh, Those guys are doing quite well. Thank you very much. But there are fewer and fewer every day. Look at the audience around here. We have an older audience of people in their 50s and 60s. And if, you, if you're in your 30s, please raise your hand. If you're 30s or younger, please raise your hand. I'd love to see how many young guns we have here that can that can take on access consulting work. And, you know, one of the things that I want to emphasize is if access were dying, how come uh, my firm is thriving? And so is uh, Stefan. Thank you. Access is my firm is thriving. I have employees on three continents. I have architects, I did access architects on staff. I've got testers. I've got senior access consultants. I've got project managers. And we are so much overwhelmed with work right now that I'm hiring. In fact, my next slide, I'll show you you can apply if you want to try apply for one of the positions we have open. Right. Before you go on to your next slide, one, can I? Put, I, was, I was going to say this earlier, put together or attempt to put together several questions. People have been talking about the fact that one of the great strengths of all the office programs is the, their inter, interoperability, for want of the right word. And of course, that's starting to decline with Outlook beginning moving towards removing COM. Um, Excel isn't removing VBO as far as we know, but of course it's now expanded into Python. So it's becoming more disparate than perhaps it was in the past. What would you say to that in terms of the continuing importance of all of the integration of different office programs? Yeah, it's a selling point. We use it as a selling point when we have clients who call us up. You know, the fact of the matter is, that one of the things, the first things we do when we have a new client call us is we show them a professionally done access database, right? All they know is Steve from the warehouse put together a database. They haven't seen a professionally done GUI, right? And so they haven't seen all the great features. And at the beginning of the call, we tell them we can make access sing and dance. And then we hear their pain first half of the call. And then the second half of the call, we, we turn the tables and we show our screen. And we show them this beautiful access application that has a document center attached where you can upload documents to the database. Either those documents are stored on a network or on a SQL server, but they're relative links, right? And But the documentation stays when in order. So if you have a complex order of a product, like for example, uh, uh, we had a roofing company that uh, so the, the roofing that had lots of documentation associated permits, photos, uh, drawings, and so forth, all that can stay within the uh, order Order screen, we show them the report generator technology we developed over the years. We can easily crack up reports to PDF, Excel, preview, email reports right from the database. We show them the company center where it gives you a 360 degree view of a company, their orders, their contacts, right? And so we have a lot of integrations with Outlook, we can with Excel and with uh, 
and even PowerPoint. We've seen some amazing integration. So it's a selling point for us. When somebody calls us and asks us for a quote, we make that a point is, this is a system that's a well worth investment for you because you can go the web app route, right? So, because they're thinking, a lot of times they're thinking, okay, do I hire a web developer or do I hire Wands firm, the access developer, right? And I tell them, it says, hey, you can do this in the web, not a problem. It's gonna cost you twice as much, twice as much, and it's gonna take twice as long, that's why it's twice as cost. And you lose that interoperability with the office suite. And so I always tell uh, my new employees when I hire them, it says, you're not being hired as an access programmer. You are a business consultant that's solving business problems using computer technology. And in this case, you're using access to solve business problems. So get out of your head that you're a programmer. No, you're, what are you? You're a business consultant that uses computer technologies to solve a business problem. In this case, we use access and SQL Server extensively. But that interoperability, that ecosystem, be able to leverage them. But here's another thing. They call me up and says, Juan, I got Office 365. I've got Teams. I've got Office. I've got Power Apps, Power BI. And the, the fact that I'm a, a Microsoft Gold partner right now, I tell them, look, we, they, they say, Juan, how can I leverage all this stuff? And now they're hearing about AI. I'm getting customers calling me about AI. How do I leverage all these tools? Because it's, like it's like a fire hose. They're trying to drink from a fire hose. And so I show them, I says, look, let me give you a demo, how we can integrate the access with all these technologies to create solutions that allow you to do more with the same amount of people, be more productive, allow you to focus on the business instead of working in the business. What other questions you got for me? What I'd like to do, one, if it's okay with you, is invite members of the access team who are present to contribute. Uh, we had, just for the information, we had four members of the access team, plus Jeff Conrad, who's worked with them in the past, here earlier. Unfortunately, Linda Cannon, who's the new product manager, had another commitment and has had to leave. But she said Dale uh, would actually speak on her behalf so if i go to dale first are you able to share dale some of the information that's being added to the roadmap later today is that private until it goes up or can you mention it uh, here uh no i can share some of that so so these are some of the things that uh, they're they not like uh cast in, in uh, concrete or anything like that but these are the current plans that will be going on to the public roadmap a little bit later and um, we are planning to do some improvements to the uh so we upgraded the charting engine for access a while back and uh so that uh, uh, created modern charts and so we will be uh making some we've been getting some requests for some uh, further improvements to the modern charting uh features that we have and so we will be adding some additional uh things into the modern charts uh, perhaps 3d charting some different um access uh cap um access formatting capabilities, like why we're make things like that. So um, that's one of the areas. Um, the SQL query editor, that has been uh, basic for quite some time. And so we are planning to do a, a significant upgrade to the SQL query editor, which I think people will like a lot. Um, hey! Hey! Uh, More people cheer, please. Turn your microphones yes. on and, and cheer that. Yes, yes. Yay. Yay. Oh, oh, yeah. Right, yes, come course, on. Yeah. Now stop. Right, carry on, please, Dale. More of that. More. Okay, uh, just a second here. Um, the uh, we so so one of the other products that Microsoft has is uh, Dataverse, which is uh, sort of our enterprise level cloud database uh, product. And so some uh, some of our customers want to use that. It does provide, once your data is in the cloud, then you can build power apps on top of it. You can um, uh, create mobile applications and some other things like that that uh, are not necessarily fully possible to do inside of Access. So some customers need those extra capabilities. And so we have a, we've built a feature for exporting, uh, essentially linking your, Ex exporting your access data into Dataverse, and then you can, you know, either use access to edit your data that's in Dataverse, just like you can do when you put it into SQL, um, or you could just, you know, use the Dataverse environment to, to uh, operate on your data. But anyway, we're doing some significant perf upgrades to the export capabilities. So Dataverse has added some new APIs that are much more performant for doing our exports when you're exporting millions of rows of data, for example. So that's 
one of the things that we're going to be doing. And then the, the last one that I think we're going to put onto the, the public roadmap. Um, so access forms uh, are sort of a constrained size on large monitors. And so we are going to do some additional work to make access forms work better on large format monitors and some other uh, features around large large format mon or large screen monitors. So another another some, hooray, another hooray, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so so those are some like I said, all of these features are not sort of casting concrete yet, but we are planning to put those on the public roadmap here very shortly. And so um, you can look uh, you know uh, there's a strong likelihood that we'll be able to get to those in the relatively near future. And so you should be expecting those in, in not too much distant time. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. Uh, Shane or Courtney, would you like to contribute anything to that already no, very I'll impressive? I'll just echo on what Dale said about the uh, Dataverse export perf. It's, it's massive. It's like huge perf improvement. Well, I'll just yeah. tell you then, as long as you keep it quiet here. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, open and SQL view, which you guys uh, have all clamored for, is is going to be soon arriving. Uh, but yeah, we, we've kind of uh, been, you know, I think paying attention to the MVP thread and uh, opening bugs, and I think doing a, a hopefully a fairly good job of of addressing some of your issues? I think I can speak on behalf of many of the MVPs and other people here saying that the there have been some very welcome responses recently. The bug fixing is, is excellent. Obviously, there's still the one monster bug that is eluding your solution. Um, and the recent changes and those to come are all very welcome, some of which I've asked for myself. Um, but that's that's great. Right. I, unless Shane wants to speak at this moment, his microphone's not on. Let me pass back to one. And this was the, the oh, slide. I know that another you, one. Oh, sorry. Go on. I know another one. Yeah. So this is, I, I, I'm not sure who opened this. Maybe it was Colin uh, who opened the issue. But uh, when you refresh a link table in uh, VBA, we blow away the indexes. And uh, oh, right. it, it's different behavior than what happens when you do it through the UI, where we, we preserve the indexes. So uh, that's in code review right now, coming soon. Did someone here request that? Morning. Sorry to interrupt. Just to clarify here, when you say refresh, you're talking about refreshing a link. So it's a link. Exactly. It's a relink more than a refresh. Um, yeah. That's what we're talking about. I think Colin did, but yeah, carry on. Right. So the command in VBA, I think, is refresh link. Yeah. It uh, is. But it's kind of a relinking. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. That's one. All right. So who said access was dead? Right. I just gave you three examples from the from the <laughs> access team right there. And they're participating in conferences. A lot of those conferences afterwards have videos available. So they can you can uh, send those to potential people who say access is dead. Well, if it's dead, why are they investing money in Dataverse? And why are they doing this? And why are they doing that? And SQL Monaco, right? Uh, I uh, had put a teaser out there uh, that I had a surprising fact if you stayed all the way to the end of the presentation. I mentioned that I have a practice with employees on multiple continents. I have a seven-figure practice doing Microsoft Access work. Let that sink in. A seven-figure practice that's focused exclusively on doing access work. So I don't want to hear about how uh, access, <laughs> there's no work for access. There's plenty of work for access. I encourage you to uh, look at my sales videos on YouTube. And if this is the first time you joined an access user group meeting, please join us at accessusergroups.org. I have a, I lead the access with SQL server group meetings every second Tuesday a month. It so happens this, this month, I don't have one, but it will be back in November. You can link with me and uh, also with the LinkedIn group. I have an access with SQL Server group on LinkedIn with more than a thousand people on there. My Twitter handle, my X handle right now, right? JSoto22. And look, let people know about the what you thought about the meeting, whether positive or negative. You know, either reply back in my LinkedIn post or tweet about it. We'd love to spread the word and you, know, you missed out on a great meeting. And we'd love to have people here live as opposed to seeing the video afterwards. Click with me on LinkedIn, and I'm also hiring at itimpact.com slash jobs. 
So uh, thank you very much, Colin, for this opportunity. Anybody has some last minute uh, questions for me or comments? Thank you. Did you guys like the like the presentation? We did. In, well, I did, certainly. Thank you ever so much, Juan. All right. If anyone wants to ask Juan a question or make a comment related to his things, could you just unmute and then I will look through the list and come to you as quick as I can, but rather than all speak at once. I know Stephen LeCompte had his hand up earlier, but then I he seemed to have disappeared, so I didn't get to you. No, no problem. Uh, I, I don't have so much of a question or maybe... I'm asking something that someone's already developed on the web, but the two features that I'd like to see is that ability where if you're linked to a database externally, that access has a feature where you push a button and it attempts to develop everything locally, all the tables, data structures locally so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think that'd be one thing as far as uh, like a synchronization that it, it can take what, what's there. And if you're temporarily disconnected from the internet, be able to feed it back when you are connected, but to have all that built instead of having to build it from scratch. Um, the other other feature would be uh, when I'm inserting a query and I have over 20,000 rows and it says, oh, well, you, this data type doesn't match. Well, out of the 20,000 rows, I got to find that one data that the data type didn't match, but it's, it's like an error. I'd have to insert each row individually. So I'm having to develop code that takes the insert convert it to select, insert each one record individually to determine the data that's causing the issue. I wish Access would show me, hey, it's this field, this data value in the field that's causing the issue instead of having to develop that from scratch. So those are the two things I'm currently having to work and build from scratch versus it'd be great if Microsoft could. That's great feedback. So I do encourage you, there is a voice Mm. of the access community colin can you talk a little bit about that website yeah the access feedback portal um and al although in the past people got the impression that it was a waste of time going to that there is the access team is very keen that people will put items on there i'm not able to find the the link instantly so if somebody else can put the link in the chat yeah. and George is really good about that yeah, and then vote for, if you go through, vote for anything you see that's already there that you think is a good idea and add anything that isn't there already. So, Stephen, perhaps so you So, I have a suggestion. That. You can, I sorry, can I just, that. one last thing. You, yes. Right, you can, sorry, one, one be a second. Right, if you, from the access program itself, if you click on the, the menu bar, you will see a feedback uh, icon. Click on that, and that will take you to the feedback portal. Yeah, I think the third yeah. thing I wanted to ask, I don't mean to take up the whole air in the room, but the third sure. thing is just to tie back to the forms. Like, when are we going to have gradient buttons and labels? Is that available? Is that also being looked into to, to have better quality oh, user interface? You have yeah. got gradient buttons. They've been okay. there since 2007. <laughs> and you can make okay. gradient backgrounds yourself fairly easily. I did it back in 2003, and nobody appreciated it, so I scrapped it. But you can do it yourself. Cool. Okay. If, if, if you're working in 32-bit, you can do it very easily. 64-bit is causing me a bit of grief on the gradients, Colin. Okay. Right. Well, back in 2003, I only had 32-bit. But, uh, yeah, it certainly can be done. Adrian, you had your hand up earlier. But it's gone. But sorry, you had your mic on earlier, but you've turned it off again. I did. I oh. was going to answer the question that I was going to bring attention to uh, Carl's question, but uh, Juan's already answered that now. So I... yeah, can I just, in case anyone hasn't seen that, right? One of the things in the publicity from Juan was here a shocking truth you will hear nowhere else. Would you like to emphasise what that shocking truth was again, Juan? That have a certain figure of practice, focus on access. Uh, it's consulting. That's something that you're never going to hear anywhere else. And I, I mentioned this to once to one of the access people on a, uh, in a, a couple of years back. She she was completely floored about what that we charge per hour and how much we make just working on the access stuff. So it's just uh, it's a it's a good living. One other thing I was going to ask you, Stefan, uh, and anybody else who goes and asks things from the access team, if you really want them to focus on that feature that you're looking for make a business use case for it, right? In other words, hey, I like to be able to do disconnected uh, 
synchronization because in the case, for example, I did where I, we, we talked about the electrical towers and the crews get dropped off in a helicopter, right? There's many other situations. Like, for example, I'm in the basement. <laughs> I had a customer who has la they does lab inventory and they work in uh, sub-level basements and there's no internet. And so I had to design something for them that was disconnected. Those are two use cases for disconnected record sets that we can do. But if you talk, put it in terms of real world, because you know, they're, they're at Redmond and they try to come, they come to go to our conferences because they like to get out and, and talk with developers and see what the client voice, we're the voice of the customer. The MVP community is the voice of the customer. So if you need to, please make that, make, make that request and also explain why that's important. And that's why we've been having this conversation with Outlook and your Outlook is terrible. The new outlook that doesn't have any com capability, that's going to damage so many databases around the world. It's not even funny. Where Jim. can I look to, to learn how to create? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, there's a question from Jeff Griffiths, uh, which is really for the Access team. Have they ever managed to fix the phantom breakpoint bug? I know what he's talking about, and it's one of those things that you'll only know it's not fixed if it happens to you again. Um, Courtney or Dale or Shane, are you able to answer that question? And if it's not fixed yet, is it on the agenda for fixing in the near future? I, I don't have an answer for that particular one, Shane, if you're still... Uh, I, don't I remember talking about it and it's not fixed. Uh, There's a bug on the VB. It's, yeah. so it's, oh, we opened a bug against VB, is that what we did? Yeah, but I don't believe it's been fixed yet. So we could, that's not under the purview of the access teams. That's what they're referring. They open up a bug with the VB team. Yeah, it does that. There are various workarounds that people are aware of. Um, anyway, oh, sorry, I did have cool. another question. I, I, I did. I didn't want to again. Just I have right. a bunch, but uh, right, a brief question then, Steve, and then, then I'll pass back to others. Yeah, the two things was about the Python. Um, yeah, so many more people today are more familiar than that with VBA. And so it seems like Excel is trying to make that push. Um, he kind of explained it. They're not going to go away from it, but uh, it seems like Python is pushing it. Um, I was kind of explaining from the Python point of view, it seems like there are more people available to use it. That's why they may want to go with an application that uses Python versus that. And then if, if Mon, you're giving them a solution, the idea that, okay, you've developed it, it's working for them, how does that work where if you're cut off from your company, are they still able to use the application that you built for some reason where they yeah. no longer pay. And I think that's the concerns a lot of people have. Even with me, if I developed something here in my job, the concern, well, this guy still can go away. I'm trying to make it so that you have documentation and someone else can take on the role of work. I was just curious how you handle that situation. Yeah, so in that case, we use GUI ID, right? That's a, that's a um, field type that you can pick when you create the table. Uh, and then you can do the synchronization and it's all a lot of code. And that's one of the things I always try to avoid. I always try to use the product naturally, right? That's why my form is all I have. I bound to record sets. I don't do disconnected forms all, for all my applications. A lot of people love doing that. It says, oh yeah, I read the data into a temporary table and then I bind the form to the temporary. No, I just bind the, I do, I bind my forms to link tables to my SQL server. But sometimes, you know, you come across these situations where you have to extend beyond the object model, the access object model, and be able to design these solutions for your clients, be able to do like that synchronization. But my philosophy is use the natural medium. Like, for example, I have a code on my blog called ReGV. If you do a search of read R E A D G V on my blog, it's a simple technique to retrieve constants across multiple sessions. What does that mean? If you have a temporary variable, once you close access, it goes away. But by using ReGV, you're using a table to store these variables, these this data, and you're able to use that in your code, a simple function to read and write back to this table. So you can have these multi-session variables that persist between sessions. And so I'm using the native work. Native work. Now, I've seen people do that with a form. They, they have a field in the form and they hide the form and they store the temporary value there. And I'm like, no. Use what the product is great at, which is handling act tables and access. So if you have any data, I tell my development staff, it needs to be an access table, a SQL server table. It shouldn't be in the form or a file or a record or in the registry sometimes. You know, we use the registry because we have sometimes no, no choice around it. But, 
you know, the fact of the matter is stick to the native stuff as much as possible. Don't deviate from the path and you're not going to have a lot of issues going forward. You, you can use custom properties, of course, custom database properties. Yeah, that too. Type. I've seen people do that as well. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Right. Are the, are the, oh, sorry. There was a comment from Shane that they have found a consistent way of reproducing the Phantom Breakpoints bug, and they've passed that that detail on to the VBA team. So hopefully that's one significant step earlier, sorry, no, sooner in terms of getting it fixed. Uh, Pat, would you like to ask your question? You can just read it. Right, okay, probably not as well as you'd say it. Can anyone on the, this is from Pat, can anyone on the Access team talk about why Access FE, oh, it's scrolled, I've lost the question. Right, why an Access front-end connected SQL Server in the cloud is like watching paint dry, even though the app and queries are optimized to retrieve the minimum rows columns. Can it be fixed? Web pages have no slowness issues. That's probably a topic in itself, Pat, but... Would anyone uh, and uh, immediate answer from Shane is I think we'd need a more specific example. Should we come back uh, to you, okay. or do you want to actually give a more specific example? Well, I, I, I have an example now. I, I I've been contacted by um, somebody who, who is a user who is developing an application that he intends to sell, and he's using Access, and he's gotten quite far, and he's connected to a I believe he is connected to an Azure uh, provider I don't I don't quite know exactly the details but the application is slow it's quite fast and you know works fine on the LAN and I looked at a number of the forms and you know queries and things like that you know he's not using anything that would prevent access from passing through the queries so the, the problem is not one where he's bringing back you know, loads and loads of records, he's bringing back one record for an update form, and yet it's taking, you know, three, four seconds to return the single record. Any comment from anyone on the team? So I, I just make the general comment. I do not think the, the average time there is three to four seconds when you're pulling data back from, from SQL. So I think something else is going on there, and there would have to be like a deeper look into what exactly that person is doing to, to figure out why why it is so slow in that particular case. So so you well so you think that this should work pretty close to land speeds, given the queries are optimized correctly. Uh, yes, like access. To, there's caching layers in between access and SQL, and so there should be, uh, you know, definitely workable performance there. Like a, a lot of the mission critical access apps are are backed by SQL, and so. And and performance with that with those apps is not something that we are routinely um, bombarded with uh, concerns about. Okay, I I have not tried this personally myself in a couple of years, but you know the last time I tried it, um, I I it was abysmal. The, you know the application worked perfectly on the LAN, and it just would not work on across the internet it was just too slow for the user to be happy with everything was sluggish and now i don't know whether it was because you know i of course since i'm testing this thing i'm buying the cheapest product i can get you know like the five dollars a you know a month you know web you know access whatever it was you know that i have to buy the 500 dollars a month version to get the speed i need um, so, so that that's possible, like definitely like free or lower cost ones can be throttled or monitor, you know, things like that. Uh, I, I don't know if that's what's happening in this particular case, okay. uh, but, you know, access going against SQL is a common scenario that is highly performant for, um, you know, a lot of mission critical access applications. I'm not talking about on a LAN. I'm talking about connected to a database in the cloud directly. Uh, well, that's. Uh, I, I don't know what their their land, you know, what the internet connection is. I don't know what the database is that you're, you know, you're, you're talking about SQL access, like a low end SQL access uh, subscription. Right. Uh, yes. So let me step in here, Pat. We have several people in this group, Maria Barnes, myself, that have talked about how to optimize access with SQL Server in the cloud. It's entirely dual because that's what we're known for worldwide. We're specialists in that area. I can tell you right I, now, it's not entirely doable. There's a series of best practices you need to follow. So if you want to DM me, 
and uh, x at jsoto.22 or my LinkedIn profile. I'll be able to give you some great tips. Uh, Maria Barnes, who's the president, chapter president of Access Lunchtime, she also recently did a session on SQL Server, I believe, Maria. Uh, Juan, revert, converting to unbound forms isn't the solution that I'm no, looking for. No, this is linked forms. Link forms. Yeah, I mentioned earlier today, I don't do unbound forms. I do link forms, okay. the SQL Server tables in Azure, and I have no performance issues. But there is a okay. series of things you need to do to make sure it is optimized. Make sure you use the latest OLBC drivers. Right now it's OLBC so every 18 and it's OLDB 19. Make sure that you're using maximizing user views and store procedures. Make sure your tables have primary, secondary, secondary keys. So there's a whole series of things that you need to do. It's just not enough to migrate to data SQL and then do a linked table and assume it's going to be fast. Far from it. There's a lot of pitfalls along the way. And that's why I created my series of videos, SQL Server Academy, that you can find on accessusergroups.org website, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube website. It's got part one, part two, and part three. And there I discuss at length how to optimize access to work with Azure. Uh, bound forms are not updatable when they're bound to pass-through queries or whatever. Correct. Right. Correct. They're not updatable to pass-through queries, but they are updatable to views if you create an index and access right. for that okay. view. So there is, they are updatable to okay. views, but you, you're right. Pass-through queries are never going to be updatable. Thanks. Can I move? Can I move on to another topic? Sorry to interrupt yes. that. Yes. Um, there was Adrian. I'll come to you in a second. Maria had a hand up earlier. Um, there was a point that Alessandro put that he works heavily with animation. And he's found ways of getting animation to work in Access, uh, but would love to see that as a built-in feature. Alessandro, do you want to to add to that comment? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I know this. <laughs> is probably not very uh, interesting for most of the audience here, but uh, that's what I, what, I, what I do with Access mostly, uh, interactive interfaces. And I would really love to see some um, graphic-oriented features, if I can say, in a future version of Access. Um, you know, some of you know, know very well the interfaces I've developed in these years, the drag and drop, the scrolling timeline, and so on. And and that would have been much simpler to do if Access included some uh, graphic-oriented functionalities. For example, how to scroll a form in any direction, or to drag an object, or or just a, a better management of the video to avoid the flickering uh, of the objects when when the form gets refreshed. Uh, things like this. I'd really love to see some graphical extensions in a future version because Access has. It, it, it access already has graphical capabilities, advanced capabilities, I would say. And and for me, it's a real pity that they are not properly and fully exploited. That's it. Just uh, it might it might help. The, it's a, it's a uh, shaky reputation. It's rickety reputation. Um, uh, but that's you've... a thought. I would I would put some suggestions in the feedback portal, Alessandro. Bear in mind, though, of course, if it's built into Access, you'll take away some of your potential income, won't you? Uh, well, <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> or maybe there'll be people wanting you your help to get them to to actually do it the, themselves. Either way, Adrian, you have your microphone on. Uh, I did because I wanted to to read out a question from Neil Jordan. Please do. It would be interesting to know the Access team's comments on the implied retraction of integration abilities that will happen when new Outlook is moved over to and moved over to and the possible knock on effects. There is a lot of concern as to how this will be perceived and what else could effectively damage Access's future. That's uh, if that wasn't clear, that was addressed to the Access team. So and I know Dale has just recently left. So. All oh, right, I didn't realize that. Cool. Courtney, are you able to respond to that? Uh, so I'll just say that uh, we've talked about it quite a bit and we've bubbled this up to the Outlook team and it's a definite uh, concern that we are, are very uh, on top of. And I don't believe we've heard anything further back from the Outlook team, but, you know, Access is not alone in this. It's, it's going to impact Excel. It's going to impact Word. So, as I mentioned in a meeting last week, 
maybe I'm naively optimistic that they're going to come around and realize that, you know, they can't just forge ahead with this plan to not support calm, but I haven't heard anything explicit back yet. I think for everyone's understanding it is being actively addressed and certainly there are a lot of people wanting to ensure that the interoperability with outlook is not lost by any of these programs but right. excel it's, needs it, it just as much a big loss for for all office apps the whole office family so as i said i don't know if i'm i'm being naively optimistic that they're going to come around but I think they're hearing this loud and clear. I well, I they're hearing it loud. They're hearing it loud, definitely. I, 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 certain, I certainly hope so. I really do. Okay. right. The, I would like to, unless there's any other questions, if they're asked, please turn your microphone on quickly. I would like to thank everybody. We haven't finished yet, but if, so please don't drop away. Um, we had 62 people here at the, the peak, and that included five people from the Microsoft team, four of whom were directly in the access team, nine MVPs I counted at one stage, and a huge number of other people, some regulars, some new. Thank you ever so much. I'm, As I say, I think it's a mixture of Juan's reputation and also the topic that, no. that intrigues no. so many people. But thank Don't you again that. to Juan for presenting today. We're very grateful for you. And if people would like to uh, show their appreciation, either in the chat or by clapping in the, if you can find the response thing, um, uh, that would be absolutely great. Do you, anything else that you want to say now, Juan, before I pass on to next month's presenter? Thank you very much, everyone. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for having me here, Colin. You're doing a great job with the Access Europe. Looking forward to being coming back next year. Thank you very much. I will certainly invite you back again. And right next month, we have John Heaser. I'm just going to share my screen and bring over the PowerPoint to next month. I will if I can get hold of it. There we go. Right. John Heaser is a UK access developer of long standing, and he is going to be talking about linking SQL Server to extend access with particular emphasis on geography data. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, then you're going to be in for a very pleasant surprise and a lot of information. John's website, you can see there, https heaser.co.uk. And you can find more details before I pass over to John from either my website or from the Access User Group's website. And John, before you do, before you actually get going, do you want me to actually load the web page so you can talk to that? Yes, please. Yeah. All right. Hopefully, it will do so now. Right. Over to you, John. You just scroll down to the. Yeah. Good point to the topic. Get, get rid of the gruesome picture. All right. There's the gruesome picture. Right. No, 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 okay. No. There we go. Um, right. So no, no shocking facts, I'm afraid. Um, it's sort of more of a pick and mix of techniques as, as described there. Um, I mean, we often use SQL Server, well, we always use SQL Server as back end for access, but we're often using it with web front ends and we make extensive use of geography data types. I mean, maybe just uh, the clients we work for have need for geographic based data, as it says there, finding local government regions. Um, ceremonial counties is a complete can of worms if anyone's ever dealt with counties. That's a UK thing, I'm afraid, but I, I dare say other countries have the equivalent. Um, and well, because Access at the moment does not support geography data type, it comes through a short text and is completely unworkable. Um, you have to use some SQL techniques such as persisted computed columns, scalar functions, stored procedures, etc., to make that data accessible within the Access application. And those techniques can be used, as it says there, for some other things. I've recently used a scalar function for something not usually, ex well, not, not very difficult, and it's something I could have done within Access, but I thought it was quite neat doing it in SQL Server, shifted some of the logic to the the server end and made the same logic available in multiple places within the access application for for no no work and that's about it and I don't, do, you, do you want to take any questions on that colin or uh if any to... if anyone wants to ask any questions at this stage yes whoever um, that was 
John, this uh, is David. Oh, hello, David. Sorry, I didn't recognize your voice. Please do. do. John, do any of the commercial GIS programs still use Microsoft Access as the data source? Uh, years ago, ArcView did, Geomedia did. Do any of them still use Access? I have absolutely no idea. Um, and as it says on the, the slide that Colin's showing, most of the data that we work with comes from the UK government. Um, you can't import it directly into SQL Server. You've got to go through quite a devious process. Um, I mean, basically, basically, we're using SQL Server because we've always used SQL Server and we use the geography data type because SQL Server does some very clever things and does them very quickly if you get your spatial indexes right. Um, that's the limit of my experience. <laughs> if I could oh, just okay. um, sort of a partial response to that, and again, it's for the UK, so it's not relevant to you in the US, David, but okay. the, I also get a lot of my uh, geographical data from the, U, the UK government, and they they provide data in various formats, JSON, CSV, et cetera, et cetera. But I also have another source of UK postcode data that, that converts it to access format, which is makes my life much simpler. Um, as far as I know, nobody provides it in a format for directly importing into SQL Server though. So it's it's convoluted, but once you've done it once, you can keep doing it over and over again. Um, so it's it's not imp it's not difficult, but the first time it's time consuming. I mean, Would when, you agree with that, John? Well, when, when you say import it into access, you, I mean, access has no concept of a geography data type. No, no, I'm not sorry. No, I'm not talking about geography data. I haven't used the geography data types, but I have used a lot of information about UK postcodes, latitude, longitude, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, which uh, is just a, just a number, but if you want to do the the clever things with uh, a qu yeah. SQL query, which actually will say find points in a polygon or points within a radius, then as far as I'm aware, you've got to use a geography data type. Well, I think we'll have a com private conversation about that tomorrow, John. <laughs> so don't <laughs> totally agree with you, but you've done things that I have never done. Um, and I'm certainly looking forward to your talk next month to find out more about them there. And, and as I said, we'll be, in t we'll be, communicating tomorrow about a separate issue anyway so um thank you ever so much all right is there anyone else that was burning to ask a question right in that case i am going to say thanks again to the huge number of people who've turned up thank you to everyone for such a well-attended meeting i hope you found it useful i hope you found it informative and thank you again to the people from the access team for giving us advanced information that as far as i know has not been made available anywhere else